This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Egypt's Old Kingdom was the age of pyramids, the first flourishing of civilization along the River Nile, lasting for approximately half a millennium from 2700 to 2200 BC, with god kings constructing funeral monuments that last to this day. The lifeblood of the kingdom was the Nile. Every year it would flood and inundate the floodplain, allowing for the planting of crops by farmers. But those floods weren't consistent. They would vary year to year, and a weak flood meant little planting was possible. And if food wasn't stockpiled by local rulers, the nomarchs, that meant almost certain starvation. Normally these weak floods would occur once every five years or so, allowing them to be somewhat managed. But around 2200 BC, the Old Kingdom was hit by weak flood after weak flood drought after drought, famine after famine, and combined with the ineffectual leadership of the old pharaoh Pepe II, the kingdom disintegrated into local rule by the nomarchs. While societal collapse generally has more than one clear-cut cause, scientists think that at least a major contributing factor to the eventual downfall of the old kingdom, and several other kingdoms at the same time, more on that in a bit, was a persistent change in the weather in the watershed of the Nile. But what caused those changes? Well, we think we know. The ocean. But amazingly, the ocean on the other side of the planet. The weather at a given location seems to vary day to day almost randomly, but there are patterns between locations. Somewhat obviously, if the weather here is warm and dry for example, then it's likely also warm and dry here. And there are also very predictable patterns in time. If the weather is warm now, then in six months time it will probably be cold because of the annual cycle. There are also, however, patterns that connect both spatial and temporal changes. Patterns of the weather changing over large areas over time. What we call a teller connection. Now the most easy to understand of these is probably the Arctic Oscillation, sometimes called the North Atlantic Oscillation. There, there is definitely a difference. Simply put, if the pressure here is higher than normal, higher relative to a long-term average, then the pressure here is probably lower than normal, and vice versa. It's a hemispheric seesaw of mass in the atmosphere, with the Arctic Oscillation Index, a number, telling you if air has sloshed towards the pole or away from it, with that change taking place over a few months. While this specific formulation of the Arctic Oscillation is actually very new, dates back to just 1998, there is some evidence, as a historical aside, that the Vikings understood some impacts of the Arctic Oscillation in the Atlantic a thousand years ago. And they noticed it because the impacts are huge, and they range across the entire Northern Hemisphere. Changes in the Arctic Oscillation impact the weather directly through changes in surface air pressure, which we can see clearly on a map. This is the average change in pressure seen during a positive Arctic Oscillation Index. But there are also indirect impacts in changing weather patterns. Both temperature and precipitation are changed across the Northern Hemisphere by the value of the AO index via changes in surface pressure. Perhaps most clearly, the value of the AO index changes how storms cross the Atlantic. If the pressure over Iceland is relatively high, while the pressure over the Azores is relatively low, then storms are more likely to track further south. And if those pressure anomalies are reversed, then they're more likely to track further north. There they are! They're listing lazily to the left! It's worth noting that the Arctic Oscillation doesn't exist in isolation. Just as any signal can be broken down into sine waves of different frequencies and amplitudes in a Fourier decomposition, the weather at a given location can be broken down into the influence of many different factors. The Arctic Oscillation is one of them, and in some cases will be a very important one, but it's not the whole story. Local geography, changes in land use, a warming trend, and other teleconnections will all play a role in constructing a weather signal. Egypt's Old Kingdom is believed to have fallen at the hand of one of those other teleconnections, one that dwarfs the Arctic Oscillation in its impacts. Perhaps the single most important mechanism of internal climate variability on Earth. The conqueror of the Old Kingdom wasn't a regional ruler, but Enso, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. This teleconnection crops up everywhere. It's been shown to have an effect on areas as diverse as Antarctic ice formation, the Indian monsoon, hurricane activity in America, coral bleaching, and agricultural yields in Africa. Sound familiar? Unlike the Arctic Oscillation, the El Nino Southern Oscillation isn't just about mass sloshing around the atmosphere. It's an interplay of the atmosphere and the ocean. It's a duet on a planetary scale. 
Here's how it works. There's a huge overturning circulation of air that reaches across the Pacific called the Walker Circulation, named after Gilbert Boomerang Walker, who identified it around the turn of the 20th century. He was nicknamed Boomerang because he was obsessed with them when he was an undergrad at Cambridge. Though, funnily enough, when you do study this stuff, his name just keeps appearing. He just keeps coming back. Air moves from east to west across the ocean before rising and returning. This is driven by a difference in surface pressure between the east and west Pacific, which varies year to year. If the pressure difference is big, then the circulation is strong. If it's small, the circulation is weak. So where does the ocean come into this? Well, the pressure difference is driven by the temperature difference between the western and eastern Pacific Ocean. And here's where it gets really interesting, because the Walker circulation doesn't just move air across the Pacific. It also induces a great ocean current of water. Water that leaves the coast of South America, moving westwards and needs to be replaced, which it is by cold, deep water upwelling from below, which changes the temperature of the eastern ocean, and so the pressure difference, and so the strength of the circulation. The ocean forces the atmosphere, and the atmosphere forces the ocean, and the interplay between the two can result in huge changes for both on the scale of months and years. In particular, there are two extreme states of the system that we refer to as El Nino and La Nina. In El Nino, conditions, the Walker circulation weakens or even reverses, and so less water is transported across the ocean and less is drawn from the depths off the coast of South America, meaning the water there is warmer than normal. In La Nina conditions, the opposite is true. The Walker circulation is stronger than normal, which means more water is transported across the ocean, more water upwells, and so the coast off South America is colder. We describe which state the system is in using some form of ENSO index, a number, the sign of which tells us if the system is in El Nino or La Nina conditions, and the magnitude of which tells us how extreme the state is. The changes in sea surface temperature and the winds will obviously have an impact on the local environment of the Pacific, but by merit of being such a vast system, research indicates that the state of the system impacts weather across the world. By combing through global datasets and analysing how they change in the aftermath of a change of the ENSO index, scientists have constructed maps of how ENSO forces precipitation, surface pressure and temperature around the world. To put it simply, changes in the sea surface temperature off the west coast of South America via the Walker circulation in the Pacific change weather across the planet in a huge teleconnection. This, like all teleconnections, is an example of internal natural variability in the Earth's climate. The planet's probably been doing this for as long as there's been a Pacific Ocean. Biological evidence indicates that it's been happening for at least several thousand years. So given the significant impacts that ENSO has on weather now, and our pretty good knowledge of where those impacts take place, it's not unreasonable to ask, could ENSO have been responsible for previous disastrous changes in the weather? Wait a minute, does anyone hear hooves? Must be zebras. While it would be cool to identify some complex part of the Earth's climate as being responsible for the downfall of an empire, we have to accept that the truth is quite possibly more mundane. That being said, there is evidence that past changes in the El Nino Southern Oscillation have changed human history. One example of which is, possibly, the downfall of the Old Kingdom in Egypt. Because Boomerang Walker didn't just identify the Southern Oscillation, he also studied its impact on the Indian Ocean. He realised that depending on the phase of the oscillation, La Nina or El Nino, the huge band of rain that forms in the Indian Ocean every year, the monsoon, was shifted. Specifically, during El Nino years, with a weaker walker circulation, less moisture is transported across the Pacific. That means there's less moisture available for rain in the Indian Ocean. So on the western end of the Indian monsoon, the Ethiopian highlands receive significantly less rainfall. And as those highlands supply between 60 and 70% of the Nile's water, that significantly impacts the flooding of the Nile downstream in Egypt. And do we have evidence that this happened consistently around 2200 BC and the fall of the Old Kingdom? Yeah! It's worth noting that not everyone agrees with this assessment that Enso, or even necessarily a drought, was responsible for the fall of the Old Kingdom. This is archaeology, and very old archaeology, so we're limited by what evidence, what data we have. But there is evidence via proxies of past climate that around 4,200 years ago, several societies collapsed at about the same time, including the Old Kingdom in Egypt, the Akkadian Empire in Mesopotamia, and the Indus Valley Civilization in India. This would point to a shift in regional climate, consistent with the 
impacts of a strong, persistent El Nino phase of ENSO. Though, again, not everyone agrees that these events were contemporaneous or connected. Damn you slow march of time and your destruction of evidence! However, we have more concrete evidence that other societies were challenged and found wanting by changes in ENSO in South America, as Brian Fagan writes in Floods, Famines and Emperors. The great Moche civilization of modern-day Peru flourished between the 2nd and 9th centuries AD, but was brought crashing down by periods of intense drought followed by catastrophic floods when ENSO flipped from El Nino to La Nina conditions. Local rulers were unable to adapt to these changes, and the society fell apart. Similarly, the Maya of Mesoamerica suffered a major political collapse and the end of the Classic period around 900 AD. Quite what caused this is the subject of huge debate, but there is plentiful evidence that prolonged droughts occurred at the time of the collapse, which would have been a catastrophe for farming and so have led to instability. Those droughts may have been caused by persistent El Nino conditions, or have been part of some broader swing in regional climate. What's clear is that localised changes in the climate, particularly persistent droughts such as those caused by changes in the ENSO index, have historically been devastating. Fagan writes that fluctuations in climate present a severe and sometimes the ultimate test of a civilization. Paleoclimatologists have identified many natural cycles that impact climate and thus life on this planet. ENSO is perhaps the most important one on short timescales, but we know there are other longer timescale cycles that take place over tens or hundreds of thousands of years, such as Kral Milankovitch cycles, that can completely reshape our planet. These natural shifts in climate have changed human history, bringing down empires and altering our evolution, guiding our development as a civilization. And our response to past changes in climate provide an idea of what challenges we face in the future, and how to overcome them. Because we're currently facing a changing climate, much like the Old Kingdom and the Moche and the Maya did. The key difference, of course, being that this is a type of change that's utterly unprecedented in its rapidity and its global scale, and the fact that it's been caused by us. Natural variability, both internal and external, will continue this century and beyond. We're still going to face the same challenges as civilizations of old, such as large changes in the El Nino Southern Oscillation Index. But we've added a new layer of challenge. There's more energy trapped in the system now. That means higher temperatures, more extreme conditions. The past teaches us that there are two options for a civilization that wants to survive a change in the environment. You either innovate, you adapt to your new environment, or you move elsewhere. But if you're talking about the climate of an entire planet, that second option isn't really an option. The fall of the Old Kingdom, the Maya, and the Moche, among many other civilizations, teach us that pretending nothing is happening isn't a viable strategy for survival when faced with a change in the environment. And what's more, we, unlike they, have caused our global shift in the climate, and so have the power to moderate how severe an environmental shift we will have to face. Doing nothing is not a strategy. We need to adapt and innovate. But we also need to stop making the problem worse. Otherwise, we can look to history to see what may happen. What's past is precedent, and possibly prologue. Boomerang Walker was a brilliant mathematician, actually graduating as senior wrangler from Cambridge, meaning that he was the number one math student that year. And specifically, he became a statistician. He used his understanding of statistics to identify the huge southern oscillation, part of ENSO, something that would have been impossible without his grounding in concepts like regression and the chi-squared test. But what are those, and how can you use them in your studies or work? Well, you can learn about those concepts with Brilliant, who have kindly sponsored this video. Brilliant is a highly visual, interactive website and app that breaks down big concepts into understandable parts. They have thousands of lessons across maths, science and computer science, covering everything from neural networks to statistics, including those techniques used by Gilbert Walker all featuring gorgeous, interactive exercises. With Brilliant, you can skill up in just 15 minutes a day with bite-sized lessons, perfect if you're trying to pick up a new skill in a low-pressure environment, brush up on old knowledge, or supplement your learning in the classroom. For those aiming for a career in STEM, or those who want to stay sharp during their STEM career, Brilliant is an excellent investment. You can check out parts of Brilliant for free, so there's no excuse to not at least have a look, but to get yourself a premium subscription and access to all their courses, you should head to brilliant.org slash simonclark, and the first 200 people to do so will get a 20% discount. That's brilliant.org slash simonclark, with thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. I don't know about you, but I find the history of science, and perhaps the history of atmospheric science, 
fascinating. So this video was largely based on the book Floods, Famines and Emperors by Fagin, as I mentioned before. So if you found this interesting, you should go and check this out. You can also, of course, check out Firmament, my book, which is about the development of atmospheric science, how we know what we know. And this is now out in North America as of this week. If you're in North America, you can finally get one like this. Look, physical, you can touch it. I really hope that you enjoyed this one. If you did, please do pop the video a like. If you'd like to watch some more stuff from me, then here's some recommended viewing. And that just leads me to say, thank you so much again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.